Welcome to Unpacked, the podcast that examines how technology is reshaping business and our world. This season, we're unpacking the topic of generative AI. My name's Stuart Black, and I'm joined, as ever, by the voice of the show, Think Tank's innovation lead, Arvind Ravishankar. Arvind, how are you today? Hey, Stuart. Fantastic. Looks like today we are the men in black. We are the men in black. We're, uh, we're not going to argue about who's Will Smith, hopefully. No fighting, please. <laughs> well, you know who that is. <laughs> I'll leave it there. In a few moments, we'll have Arvin's deep dive interview with Shikhar Ghosh, who's a professor at Harvard Business School. I can't wait for that. Arvin, can you tell us a little bit about what we can expect? Absolutely. Um, so Professor Shikhar Ghosh teaches a course in Harvard on how disruptive technologies change businesses. So today I'm going to be unpacking three such technologies with him and specifically going into AI and looking at its impact on business. Fantastic. Uh, but before that, we're going to take a look at a couple of uh, big things happening in the world of AI. Uh, our top story today is about AI elbowing its way to the top of the priority list at the 2024 World Economic Forum in Davos. Uh, despite the event's official theme being rebuilding trust, the emphasis shifted towards AI with some two dozen panel discussions featuring AI in the title. One of these conversations focused on the human effect and in particular the question of employment. Uh, there was concern about a recent IMF study suggesting up to 40% of global jobs could be at risk from AI advancements. The speakers there stressed the need for both corporate and public sector leaders to wake up to what this might mean. So Arvind, are leaders asking the right questions about AI? I think they are, Stuart. Um, I'm completely in agreement with these questions. See, um, a generative AI is considered now as a general purpose technology, right? In in the area of technology, it's considered a general purpose technology. It's, you know, people, the analogy for it is electricity, for example, or the internet. And what's interesting about those technologies is that they proliferate wide and deep, and mm. they're going to touch every aspect of our life. And so that is the right question to ask, you know, uh, what? how does it change employment for human beings? It's not just the IMF. Interestingly, you know, right at the beginning when OpenAI published their, or when they came out of ChatGPT, you know, they published research papers and they quoted at that time, this is almost a year and a half ago, that 80% of the population will at least see 10% of their jobs affected or improved and 20% of the population will see at least 50% of their tasks impacted, right? So this was like a year and a half ago, they predicted that. And since then, many people have been predicting this. So yeah, I think it's a really important question to ask. Uh, I don't think it's a question we should be fearful about. It's a question we should tackle head on and discuss. Well, on that topic, how should businesses prepare for the potential displacement of jobs due to AI? What should they be doing? You know, that's a great question, Stuart. I think in my opinion here, I feel business leaders are almost more responsible and accountable for how the job market needs to change. Because, um, you know, a lot of times we put it in the, put it in the job of the regulator, regulators and the government, but if business leaders ask the following question, I think it'll help the job market. The question to ask is, when you are building your businesses, what is your objective function? If you're, obje if you're maximizing profit, and that is your only objective function in building your business, without regard to your employees, without regard to the society, without regard to the planet, then that is the wrong objective function to go after in today's world, right? The awareness mm -hmm. for how businesses play an important role in society is a lot higher today. And people have less tolerance for businesses that don't consider all angles of society. So I would say that it, it begins with a business leader asking that question. What is my objective function when I am developing technology? And how am I, how am I taking my own team, my own employees into account and what am I doing to upskill them? What am I build, doing to ensure that this job market and this displacement is done in a manner where the employees benefit from it or they don't get too disrupted by it, right? I think business leaders play a really important role. 
And are there any particular strategies that might be implemented to retrain or redeploy uh, workers who are affected? As you say, I mean, even though it's affecting everybody, what's the what's the approach? I think right now it's difficult to it's difficult to have a particular strategy in mind because the the impacts of AI or the better actually I wouldn't say impacts the benefits of AI are not yet fully understood. Um, because it's a general purpose technology, if you remember the internet in the beginning, right? The, the benefits were everywhere, use cases were everywhere, right? And over a period of time, people understood what the real value is and people reshaped their lives and businesses. Same thing will happen. I think you need another year or two to really understand what type of jobs and what level will these jobs improve because of AI and how people need to change. So I would say the best the best strategy still is to always be conscious of every decision you're making and what mm-hmm. the repercussions of the decisions are. I think today that is your best strategy. Well, we're all we're all learning and uh, and keeping abreast of everything we can. Um, our second story today concerns an innovative cultural project at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, where an AI-driven representation of the artist Vincent Van Gogh is able to interact with visitors. This was built using Van Gogh's own letters, as well as various biographies, and the resulting avatar can answer a whole range of questions about his life, even on sensitive topics such as the artist's depression and ultimate suicide. That sensitivity does mean that some human oversight has been needed. Um, Arvind, what do you think about this one? Does it seem like a smart way for the museum to stay relevant with modern audiences? There's obviously an ethical dimension to this. What's your take? I think that it's a, I think it's a very smart way for the museum to stay ethical. Like, um, for example, I'm a huge fan of Charles Darwin. And if somebody creates an AI model that I can interact where it, to some degree, if it's able to tell me about his life, if I'm able to ask questions, I, I would be, I would be brought, bought in, right? Now on the, on the topics that are a little more sensitive, um, it's hard for me to say, Stuart, because at the end of the day, the question is, uh, is it okay to tell the truth? I mean, if there is a truth behind it, if, for example, a lot of times movies dramatize, right? But they don't tell you the real facts behind what it takes. So uh, maybe to be a genius like he was, there were some other negative consequences to it. And why should we hide that? I don't know, right? It's a tough question. Um, is Is it wrong to tell the truth? Well, let me throw another tough question at you. If in a hundred years' time there was an AI doppelganger of you that was interacting with uh, 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 all all kinds of people all around the world, how would you feel about that? If they'd (laughs) had access to all all, all your records and all your all your writings, and and they brought you back, how would you feel? I would love it. That would be so (laughs) freaking cool. That would be so freaking cool. Will it? Will people really want to talk to it? I don't know, (laughs) but. It would be cool. Uh, for me, that would be pretty cool. It's a way for me to stay alive for a long time. Well, maybe and, one day there'll right. be an AI versions of both of us talking to each other and, um, <laughs> and maybe a few people watching still. <laughs> yeah, that's such a cool idea. I've never thought of that, by the way. It's such a cool idea. I love it. So maybe I should start, uh, for everybody, maybe we should start recording everything in the digital world so that somebody can recreate us right in the future. It's pretty cool. Is this it? We're, we're all going to become you know, writers of our own biographies, making sure there's enough material out there to, to have a, a convincing exactly. a AI version one day. Very you, interesting. You've given, me, you've given me a new idea. I think I'm going to start. I, I write a journal, but I think I'm going to start a digital journal. Put down all my <laughs> thoughts. Uh, and Arvin, can you tell us uh, a little bit more about what you're focusing on in today's interview with Shikhar Ghosh? So, Professor Shikhar Ghosh studies three technologies, artificial intelligence, blockchain, and genetic engineering. And he teaches a course in Harvard on how these three technologies are coming together almost like a triangulative force that will completely change businesses. So it's going to be a really interesting conversation, and I'm totally looking to unpack this with him. Well, fantastic. Without further ado, here's Arvin's deep dive interview with Shikhar Ghosh. Our think tank focuses on researching emerging technologies that will shape your future. From generative AI to exoskeletons, we study the impact these technologies will have on business, humanity, and our planet. 
And through our podcast, newsletters, and social media content, we have a direct line to a truly global emerging technology community. So if you'd like to find out more about the impact these technologies will have on your business, then reach out to our team at lab45thinktank.com. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Unpacked. Uh, technology such as artificial intelligence, blockchain, Web3, um, and CRISPR, right? Genetics engineering. Are these technologies, are they superficial in their change within organizations? Or are these technologies going to foundationally impact the way organizations are designed, their business models, their customers, the way they measure return on investment? These foundational building blocks of any business, are they going to change because of these technologies? This is a course that a professor at Harvard Business School teaches. The name of the course is 2035, three technologies that are going to reshape the world in the next decade. The professor joining us today is a professor of management practice in the entrepreneurship managerial unit at Harvard Business School. He also works and heads the Generative AI Observatory, which is a part of D3, one of the largest digital research labs in the world. So I'm really excited to have Professor Shikhar Ghosh from Harvard Business School join us today as our guest. Professor Ghosh, welcome. Thank you. Um, before we dive into the actual uh, the actual course and also your views on this, tell us about your journey, right? Like, how did you pick these three technologies? How did you start teaching this course? Tell us a little bit about that journey. I've been teaching for about 15 years. But before that, I spent the previous 25 years building companies. And my most successful companies have been at this threshold when new technologies come in. About three years ago, I started to look at AI and some of the things that were happening in the blockchain and biology. And there was this shift that was occurring, which every two months when I looked at it, something new had happened that was mind blowing. And so I started to put that together in some form. And then I said, this is something our students need to know about. I firmly believe that it's true that we're witnessing a transition into a different phase um, and that we don't really know what, what is going to happen with this. Um, and we see evidence of this every day in the newspaper when you have really smart, really knowledgeable people making polar opposite arguments about really fundamental things. Mm. And then you have everybody around the field trying to make sense of this. How could that possibly be true? Uh, and my answer is that both those positions are true, or at least are possibilities. That's amazing. And, you know, I'm an et eternal optimist, so I like that other point of view. <laughs> but I can completely imagine that we, things could get disrupted depending on how we take it forward. So tell us a little bit about both, Professor Sh Shikhar. Um, tell us a little bit about why you think this is so disruptive, where it's going to foundationally shake up our businesses and also why maybe we need to be careful about it. So there are, you know, there are a number of things that are different, but I focus on three things. The first is exponential. We have never had a technology that has exponentially grown over long, long periods of time. And so when you start to look at these technologies, both the rate of growth and the size of many of these things, you start to use trillion very, very easily. The second thing I think that is that is not fully appreciated is that we think about this as the last two years or even the last year, chat GPT comes along, everybody looks at it. But we've been laying the groundwork for this over the last 30 years. The reason, so when you think about technologies, there is the power of the technology, which is the exponential, and then there is the diffusion of the technology. When often people will compare these technologies to nuclear, when you think about the threat, uh, because it's the one threat that we've had before that was existential for the whole world. And so when people think about the negative side, they say, you know, but we've been able to control, control nuclear. 
Now, the big difference is that this is individual. So an individual can do tremendous good or tremendous harm almost immediately. And we've never really had that before. You only need one or two bad actors to cause tremendous damage. One statistic that, that I've always um, sort of marveled at is that roughly 70, 70 to 75 percent of all the COVID misinformation came from 12 accounts. And it's because these technologies not only create the information, they also distribute the information at a scale that we've never seen before. And we've just never had a governance problem like that before. Wow. Um, and Professor Ghosh, you make an argument that we're not ready for this, right? As enterprises, as governments. And I can, I'm beginning to see why you believe, why you make that argument, because when you look at the power of exponential growth, or when you look at the power of exponential diffusion of those technologies, or even the fact that it's now in the hands of the many and not just a few, you begin to understand some parts of that, but could you elaborate a little more? Um, why do you feel that enterprises and business or governments need to fundamentally change to accept this new reality? So, you know, I think um, E.O. Wilson had said a long time ago, the famous quote that said, uh, the biggest problem we have is that we have Catholic uh, brains, medieval medieval institutions, and godlike technology. <laughs> I think that that whole contradiction is coming coming up where our medieval um, institutions are coming through. But with that, I think there is one other factor that's coming in, which is the reason why this technology is so disruptive is because it is so good. So because it can do, you know, and if good is defined as profit making, uh, as something that society wants and is willing to pay for, is therefore coming through, there is so much profit to be made through this process that people will continue to invest in it. I think from a business's point of view, what you start to see is that the biggest profit pools and things you considered moats um, <clears throat> all start to disappear uh, because you can start to do things that you that were unimaginable before at rates of progress. So the cost of what you're saying is the cost of cognitive or essentially the the cost of intellectual labor also is going to go down to zero. Yeah. And well. creative labor. And creative you know. labor. Yeah, exactly. So in my experience with the internet, when when a certain point was reached, people said, oh, banks are going to be out of business and publishers are going to be out of business and so on. And none of those things were, were really true. What actually happened over the next 15 years was that people's business models got restructured completely. And the people who survived at the end of that were the ones that could take advantage of the new business model. And so the way that the process worked was far more by termites rather than tornadoes. It wasn't that this wave came and destroyed all these businesses. There were a few like Encyclopedia Britannica, but it was that the sound of the competition was nibbling rather than explosions. So do you think these enterprise leaders, as they work through this exponential rate and growth, two questions for you. The first one is, um, do you see their core, their core, um, purpose for the next five, 10 years is going to go towards figuring out what algorithms to create and how to derive value from it. Is that where you see leadership going? Is that how people are going to derive in business? Is that going to be the core designing factor? Um, how do you create and how do you leverage algorithms? Um, and the second area I want to talk about is decision making of these leaders. But let's start with that. Professor Ghosh, do you feel that to, in tomorrow's world, your lead, your ability to make money, your ability to work as an enterprise leader is going to be dependent on the algorithms you can create and work with? I think, I think that's one element of it. So yes, you need the algorithms, but you also need to rethink 
what is your business? And that is both on the upside and the downside. I love it. How do you maximize the upside? That should be what we're looking at. Yep. Yes, and and the downside is also a very different kind of downside. So it's not the downside of, you know, I've made a mistake, there's going to be a change in regulation, the kinds of things that people put on their risk list. The downside is that the world explodes, you know, that the world that you live in, the, the business proposition that you have. Um, and that's a very hard set of uh, projections that somebody that in the C-suite has to make. A year or two ago, people were saying data is king. Now, all of a sudden, with the generative large language models, you can just borrow the data that OpenAI has done and just fine tune it with a little bit of data on top. Um, but there's an art to figuring out how much data do you need, how clean does it have to be, what can you use, what can you not use. So it's really a different way of thinking about what is this business. And we're in the very early innings of that. Um, so your know, leaders have to have to so sort of re-look at this and say, how could this possibly change my business? And some of the, the constraints that we have put on business um, need to, this becomes an R&D project in some ways of your whole business. It, that's amazing. Are you seeing any new business models starting to emerge already? You know, digital gave, gave birth to a whole new set of business models. Are you starting to see such new business models emerge in AI or it's too early at this point? I think it's still pretty early. What we're seeing, you know, if you think about the internet, the Mosaic browser came out in 1994, 1993 or 1994. Uh, that's when we started Open Market. And, you know, Google didn't exist till the end of the 1990s, early 2000s. And it didn't have a business model for the first four or five years of its existence. So, um... I do want to unpack that a little more, Professor Ghosh. But before I do that, I do want to ask you, we are not taught to think in exponentials, right? I understand it on a graph, but what does it really mean in the physical world? It's hard for me to understand. So how how should leaders prepare for this, right? How are you, how are you teaching leaders to prepare for this? Are there some new skill sets that they have to learn? Are there new things that they need to be aware of? The one thing that I think is really useful is for every leader of every company, but, but all the way down, to, in, to immerse themselves in the technology. How do I actually make this work? How does this work for a range of problems that I'm doing? And I think there's a top down, which is a education and really understanding and speculating. And then there's also a bottom up of letting people know what's happening letting people actually pursue a number of different things as, as sort of the first generation of this. I think the second thing I'd say is have some specialists who are keeping track of how fast the field is moving. Mm. Because, you know, people will say, oh, these models are completely um, opaque and we can't do that for something like credit because the law says that we have to justify, um, you know, why we gave, why we didn't, why we denied credit. The law doesn't say you have to justify why you gave credit. Right? And so you could, for example, double somebody's credit line. You could continue to do these things using models like this. But increasingly, these models are becoming transparent. They're becoming, you know, you can make models with smaller things, with smaller data sets. You can make them multimodal. You can use, you know, all of the conversations that you're that your customer service people have to train models that then do other things. All these things are happening very, very fast. And having people say, you know, this is a problem now. And this will be a problem three years from now because it's inherent in the technology. Or this is a problem now, but, but you know, by the time we finish this project, someone will have solved it. Those sorts of things, I think, that intuition for it um, is something that senior leaders need to develop. And the only way that you develop it is by being engaged. So do you by, see that in the next five years, do you foresee that leaders will not be able to make decisions without a co-pilot, some form of artificial intelligence? I think it, I think leaders who are using that technology and have some wisdom about how to use it 
will make far better decisions and far more efficient decisions mm. than people who don't. Mm. You know, at some level, it's a tool, though it's becoming more than just a tool. But but I think a useful framing on it for someone who's running a business and has practical things and quarterly numbers to meet and so on is to start to say, how can I use it completely as a tool? And you know, constantly start with it as your starting point, and then improve on what it's done, if you can. So, you know, one of the things that you had mentioned as we were talking through was the fact that this cost of cognitive capital will go to zero, right? But if you see, if you kind of forecast more than that, and you believe that we will land up creating far superior intelligence, how do we remain relevant? Like, why is society moving in this direction of trying to create something more intelligent than us? And how would we remain relevant in that roadmap? Is something that I wonder about. Yeah, I think I think we should, and I should wonder about it. And I think there's two things on it. One is humanity doesn't decide anything, right? We, you know, so we individually make choices. Sometimes we do it at the state level. Sometimes. And this is the first time you've had sort of anyone at any level of that stack can make that choice. The second thing is that there is a very strong incentive um, to keep doing this because there is so much good and so much profit and so much benefit that comes from it, even so much harm that benefits some people. And the more intelligence you have, the more powerful the tool is. And so this is a little bit like, you know, should the gorillas have allowed humans to, to exist? <laughs> right. Um, eventually, it's going to come back. I also think that the time frames you're looking at are probably longer than than we should look at, just in terms of of the times at which, in 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 certain domains, it will become more capable than humans are. I'm hearing about companies being run by AI versus human, right? companies that will have an AI CEO or uh, maybe initially it'll be these intermediary companies. I'm not sure who they would be, but I'm hearing about that. And what I'm wondering is how is it possible for an algorithm to make certain decisions where there's emotions, human interests involved? Um, Because a lot of times decision-making finally lands up being emotional. And this is goes back to maybe your quote on the fact that we have paleolithic brains, right? And so we make emotional decisions. Um, how would an AI account for human humanity's interests when it makes those decisions? And it, for example, AI may not value the opera at all. Like, why would it, it probably it? won't? And you know, and I'd argue that humans don't value the opera either when they're making company decisions. Yeah. What they value is the profit that comes from the opera, right? And uh, and so, you know, when you look at companies, you can almost think about them as AI systems. They have an objective. They have a set set of agents that are that are fine tuning different things, uh, which is why you get anything that's not within the the company's objective function gets discounted. Right? We we have a lot of difficulty as humans figuring out what is the real objective of what we're trying to do. You'd mentioned, you know, we make decisions based on emotions. That is true. Uh, We don't make decisions based on values necessarily. And so I'd make a distinction between those two. Um, and, And I think that, you know, in some ways, AI can do many of these things better than we can because it's not emotional. Uh, But then the key thing is we have to then make the objective function that it's trying to achieve better than what we have. Mm. So, you know, and where I see this really coming in is in the sciences. So they're the objective function of saying, we want to create a new drug that goes after this particular condition and has very few side effects. You know, that we can all agree on the effective, on the objective function quite well. You know, we want to create fusion to create without danger so that we can have unlimited energy. Those sorts of problems, we're, I think it's going to radically change what we can do. In a lot of the <clears throat> other problems that go around society, what kind of society do we want? What kind of information landscape? What kind of political system? That's when I think the problems get to be really difficult mm. because we don't know what we want. 
um, or, or, you know, some people know and other people know differently. Uh, and so I think that's where with this, you know, again, vaccine, the COVID example is a good example of that, where some people might genuinely believe that, that these vaccines are really bad for humanity, but it gives them this huge power to then influence 30% of the population to not take vaccines. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, you know, and, and the, they start with very, you know, I'm assuming that they start without any nefarious purpose, they start with a true belief that this is actually dangerous. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, I, I think it becomes very complicated very quickly when you move away from things where the objective functions are very clear and where we can all agree on what the objective functions are. You know, we could, you could say we should have an objective function around truth, but that's just not true. Look at Twitter. We don't have, we have an objective function around the ability for anyone to say anything uh, and amplify anything and work anything through and so on. Wow. Actually, that's a lovely way to think about it. What is the objective function, right? And I think even for us humans, I don't think we clearly know what our own objective functions are, right? As humans. So that's a nice way to think about it. And I think in businesses, maybe it's a little more clear, which is why you're starting to see AI disrupt businesses. Yeah, it's more clear, but it's not clear that it's the right thing. So it's clear in terms of what we try to do is to improve profit and improve return on the investment we're making or profit. But that's a very crude measure for how does this then affect everything else? And Google's a great example of this. You know, the, Google has tried to be responsible in many ways. Uh, when you look at AI, you know, Google has really been seminal in its in its research and most of the big steps have come through Google and they were very constrained about how they were putting things out until OpenAI and Microsoft came along and, and you know, in Satya Nadella's words, he wanted to make Google dance and they started dancing. Right? But as soon as the core search engine franchise had any risk to it, right, they're, they're gonna be as aggressive in terms of releasing these things as, as anybody else. Um, and so then you, you switch from someone trying to be responsible to a race dynamic. Um, and then the objective function of profit, shareholder returns, and so on, dominate everything else. Um, and all these costs then are external. So I think that these are some of the things that we need to start rethinking um, as to what constraints, what are the costs of doing it, who bears the cost, what happens when... You know, especially things you can't measure, like trust in a system, or that are not captured in the normal measurement systems. Wow. Um, reminds me of, honestly, I'm starting to think of prisoner's dilemma, right, that you learn in business school where you have two companies and they're trying, both companies don't advertise today. And then one company starts to advertise, so the other one has to advertise to keep up. And at the end of the day, after some time, both their costs increase and both companies don't land up benefiting from it. So we are sort of... You actually bring up a really interesting and important point. All of these problems now are becoming real. You know, someone has to program the thing to do one thing, one kind of trolley problem solution versus a different one. You have a self-driving car, the driver is sitting at the back. You know, do you go and kill the child who's crossing the street or do you save your owner? that kind of problem, you know, that's no longer a theoretical problem because it's, it, it has to be programmed into the system to do it. And you have a thousand variants of that that are coming in all the time. Um, you know, Google, Meta, all these companies have been facing it with misinformation. And then Twitter comes along and says, I don't care. Um, and now everybody has to recalibrate what they're doing because their objective function is still profit. You know, these are just sort of constraints around it and constraints that come back to it. Um, um, Professor Ghosh, you've definitely convinced me that through all the illustrations, the stories, the examples, and some of your viewpoints, that we are not yet fully ready <laughs> for these changes, right? Whether it's a business or the government, regulators, technology leaders, we're not ready. I think another really crucial point that you've brought out in this conversation is um, the individual matters as much as talking about it from the whole humanities 
viewpoint, right? To your point today, the power of the technology doesn't lie in just a few people's hands, but it's in everybody's hands. And so there is a democratization of that. So as individuals, the more responsibility we take and the more we are you know, almost to some degree mindful right, about how we are making these decisions and what we learn, I think is going to be really important. Any closing thoughts from you for the enterprise leaders, um, especially the ones who are trying to figure out how to navigate AI? Yeah, I think a couple of things. One is start with the recognition that what we're going through now over the next, you know, what started maybe a year ago from most people's consciousness, but five years ago from the actual development is a, is a complete shift in anything we've seen. And so you as a leader of a company, your primary responsibility, you know, you have people to do your marketing and your costing and your everything else, but your primary responsibility is to set the strategy and decide on the people. And all of a sudden you've got to earn your pay. And what I mean by that is you have to have a perspective and the only way you can have a perspective is to immerse yourself in not so much the details of the technology, but enough of that so that you know which way it's going. And with that, you say, what is, you have to go back and dig pretty deep about what's my purpose? What's my objective? How does this actually play out going forward? I think the second thing that you have to do is be willing to do a lot of experiments. Some will work, some won't work, <clears throat> but what it'll do is it will teach your organization to learn, you to, to constantly learn in that process as opposed to just to predict an outcome, <clears throat> measure that outcome and say it was good or bad. Because um, you because the world will keep changing. Um, <clears throat> I think the third thing that you have to do as a leader is to get involved in the shaping of this technology. It's going to affect every part of society and you need to have a voice in it. And you need, because if you don't then, and the technology becomes unbridled, you'll be forced to join that race. Uh, and so there might be restrictions you want to place. There might be standards you want to have. There might be points of view on how data can and cannot be used. Uh, there might be you know, particular things that you want to do in terms of how um, your employees are treated if their jobs go away or people are retrained. These are all questions that you as a leader have to have a point of view on. And you can't just be reactive. You have to, these are very complex things that are changing. And so you know, your, your role as a leader, um, you, know, you really have to start earning your pay at this point. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Ghosh. That was amazing. I'll say one more thing just before we close that we didn't cover that maybe we'd do it at a different time is most of what we've done so far has been talking about AI as an external agent coming into organizations. What we haven't talked about is the big shift that's coming, which is AI changing our brains and changing our bodies. And that's happening right now. <clears throat> So, you know, when you think about CRISPR, you think about our genes, if you think about our brains, um, these are all systems that are completely susceptible. They're, they're very, very complex systems um, where we have a core understanding of how things work, but we don't really know. But AI is going to start to make a huge difference. And if you can imagine that the role of, say, advertising was always to change people's minds, um, imagine if you can do that from inside the mind, you know, with with a neural link chip or something, <laughs> or you can deeply, you know, change someone's memory. Um, all these things are now becoming possible at scale. That's um, true. So, you know, that's a shift we haven't talked about, but it's but it's happening. It's a few years behind. I think we will. Um, we will most probably will do another podcast with you where we will talk about these. But what was, what's interesting to me as you were talking through that was that I always believe that the problems that come up tend to have some solutions also that emerge. So maybe the problem of dealing with this exponential growth and this huge uncertainty is through the modification of the human mind. <laughs> maybe as we, we evolve, right, as humans evolve through the integration of technology, we become more adept at handling technology. 
Uh, who knows, right? Uh, it's, it's for the future to tell us. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, Sam Altman was in my class um, before all this, you know, before ChatGPT came out and it all exploded. Mm-hmm. And he made this comment where he said, we are now in a world in which if you take any group of people and you say on some topic, if you take the smartest person versus the median person, you'll have maybe a three standard deviation difference in whatever measure, level of intelligence, level of knowledge, level of something. He said, think about a world where there's a million standard deviations difference between the person who's been augmented and the person who hasn't. Um, he said, you know, how do you operate in a world like that? And I think that's sort of the way we're going. So thank you so much. Thank you. Marvin, fascinating interview as always. Um, I wonder if you'd be uh, so good as to highlight some of the key points uh, from that interview for us. Sure. You know, Stuart, what's amazing is um, a professor is supposed to make you think. They're not really supposed to give you all the solutions, right? A, A good professor is supposed to spark curiosity within you and make you think. And I think Professor Ghosh did that today. He absolutely did that. The conversation was rich with insights, and each of those insights raise questions within you, make you think in a different direction. Um, So I think what I want to do to summarize his episode is a little different from what we normally do. Rather than talk about solutions, etc., I'm going to talk about the three things that business leaders need to start thinking about because of the disruption of technology, right? So we'll do it a little different to summarize this episode. It also Great. does just justice, right, to what Professor Shikhar Ghosh has told us. Um, so there are three reasons why you should be paying very close attention to artificial intelligence and its growth. Number one, because of the idea of exponentiality, right? The human brain can only think linear. We're we're not very good at thinking in the exponential scale. And AI is, today, the growth of AI is happening at an exponential scale. Like if you look at, and I can relate to this, the models a few years ago versus the models today are completely different. And, you know, Stuart, a month from now, if you have another conversation, those models are gonna be further different. And so he's absolutely right. The second uh, area that he talks about is the fact that not only is it growing exponentially in its uh, evolution as a technology, but because of digital and the internet, these technologies rapidly diffuse within society. That's the second part, right? So today, if Facebook creates a new feature, imagine this. If they turn on the feature tonight in Facebook, tomorrow, a billion people have access to it. Mm. You could have never thought of that 10 years ago or 100 years ago, right? Where you have a new feature and the next day morning, a billion people have access to it. So technology diffuses profusely. And then, so the third the third important point that he brought up was that today, individuals have more power than humanity as a collective ever before, right? So for example, when he looked at nuclear as a threat, like, uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago, Nuclear was a technology that not everybody had access to, right? But artificial intelligence is accessible to everybody today on your phone. So uh, everybody today, the average human being has the power to disrupt entire societies. So these are the three things that a business needs to talk, think about when they're releasing these technologies, when they're developing these technologies, have these three things in mind because they're gonna fundamentally reshape everything, the way you do ROI, the way you release products to market, your go-to-market speed, the channels in which you deploy, everything changes if you start thinking in these three lenses, right? I think that was his core message. And I encourage everybody to, if you if you only skipped, if you skipped and listened to the conclusion, please go back and listen to the whole episode. It was a riveting conversation. Fantastic. Well, all it leaves me to say is uh, thanks to uh, Arvind Ravishankar for uh, leading that interview with uh, Shikhar Ghosh and all your amazing insights today. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, Stuart. If you like our podcast, please like, subscribe or tell a friend. I'm Stuart Black and see you next time on Unpacked.